So I'm going to start by welcoming everybody, especially welcoming Kevin Dean, who's helped us organize this learning lab and edited, co-edited the special edition, and of course to Bridget, who's going to present. This is a, the learning lab is one of the services or resources offered by the Strive Research Consortium, which is led out of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine with partners in South Africa, India, Tanzania, and Uganda. And we do a monthly learning lab, and we invite you to go on to any page of our website and sign up for the invitations, because we do offer a range of really interesting subjects. Um, very easy to join, as you can see. We look forward to your participation and comments and questions for Kevin and Bridget. So, Kevin, I'm going to hand over to you now, if you'd okay. like to introduce the special edition and take it from there. Thanks so much. Yeah. Of course. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us for today's Learning Lab. Um, as Annie said, I'm Kevin Dean. I'm currently a lecturer in international development at the University of Northampton. Um, and this is an, an event that we put on today uh, to promote the, the special issue of the Review of African Political Economy, uh, specifically on the political economy uh, of HIV. Um, now, it's a very brief background. This special issue, issue grew out of a, a workshop that was held in London in, I think, 2012. Um, this was funded by the Review of African Economy and also by the Centre for African Studies, um, which is part of the University of London. Um, and on the back of that workshop, we then decided to put together this um, special issue. So the special issue contributions cover what we think are a number of important current issues, including conceptual issues regarding the role of structural drivers of the epidemic, which we're going to hear, hear about from Bridget, a critical discussion of interventions such as microfinance and cash transfers, uh, an assessment of different approaches to understanding sexual practices such as concurrency and transactional sex, uh, as well as other challenges related to the international response. And I guess in keeping with the, the, the theme of STRIVE itself, you know, we're, we're seeking to promote a strong critical social science response to the epidemic, building on and advancing previous research that addresses the economic and social drivers of the epidemic. I think also importantly, um, the special issue seeks to bridge the gap between various different disciplines. You know, we have a lot of people writing from a social science perspective in public health on HIV. We have people writing from a, a social science perspective in either political economy or development journals. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes these bodies of, of, of work can, can remain disconnected. And I think, as you'll see from the contributors um, in the special issue, if you look at the table of contents, we have uh, we brought together um, a range of different contributors working from different disciplinary backgrounds, and, and we really hope that, that this, this is a, a move towards a, a more coherent social science uh, approach. So uh, I'm really delighted that Bridget has agreed to, uh, to talk to us today. Bridget began as an anthropologist but moved towards development studies with her work in the Centre of African Studies and in the economics faculty at Eduardo Modlana University in Maputo. She subsequently worked in the population and development, rural development and methodology programs at the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague, from which she's now retired. Her current research is on rural labour and rural health in Mozambique, and she is a research associate of the Institute of Economic and Social Studies in Maputo. So Bridget will speak for around 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for, for questions and discussion afterward. So please do either type me a question or raise your hand, and we'll, we'll make sure we get to all of you, well, as many of you as possible. Okay, so I'm going to mute myself now, and I will hand over to Bridget. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I thought I'd start by explaining why I wrote this paper. I'm not a long-term HIV AIDS specialist. The key lies in the fact that I lived in Mozambique, therefore in Southern Africa, from 1979 until 1992, and I've continued to do research there. So I was there in the time when there was no HIV AIDS at all, through the period when there was skepticism in some quarters about HIV AIDS, and the majority of information came from the Ministry of Health through the public health system sent out to health posts. Uh, on to the mass inflow of NGOs, both international and local, um, doing social marketing uh, aimed at changing individual sexual behavior. And now 
to the period when, including in Mozambique, the word structural intervention appears in HIV AIDS work and the people involved have changed. And the most important thing probably is that there is increasing but really already quite large access to ART, antiretroviral therapy. So for me, of course, these events, the emergence of the word structural prevention, the term structural prevention, seemed to me a positive thing uh, because it had been long clear that people had very high knowledge about HIV AIDS uh, in most places, including in rural areas, but did not necessarily change what they were doing. And secondly, from the period, almost from the beginning, there had been people who had dissented from the emphasis on ABC, particularly on condom mar social marketing, because of its emphasis on individual sexual behavior and people who had used the word structure. After all, uh, Farmer's work on structural violence emerged out of his work on HIV AIDS in Haiti. So this seemed to me quite positive. But as I began to look at uh, what was actually being done, I began to be uh, disturbed. And it seemed to me that the break with earlier approaches and the assumptions of early approaches was not really being done. Rather, structural prevention was a kind of an add-in into existing work um, that was already going on. And secondly, the way in which the word structure was used was also troubling to me. And thirdly, there seemed to me to be a whole tradition within epidemiology itself that wasn't being brought in to these discussions. This tradition that uh, informs social medicine in Latin America, that um, is represented by people like Navarro who are concerned with health and inequality, or Nancy Krieger, that draw a lot of inspiration from, say, the work of Virchow in the 19th century. And this had quite a different focus, uh, which really wasn't appearing, I thought, in these new discussions of the structural causes of HIV AIDS and therefore was not informing prevention. So I decided to look at it all much more closely. After going through the work that was available, it seemed to me that the strongest tradition, dominant tradition, but also strongest analytically, was the social structural drivers approach, which has gained new purchase. Strive itself represents uh, this approach, I think, and um, which um, for me was well represented by the work of Justin Parkhurst, another author in the special issue. Um, and I wanted to look very closely at what this approach meant. So I think that what's important here is, this is my construction, but in reading, it seemed to me that there was a kind of a model behind the approach, which looks at, as a final outcome, HIV AIDS, morbidity and mortality, but distinguishes between proximate, immediate biomedical determinants of exposure to HIV and determine the probability of infection by HIV, and the distal determinants, and the social or structural, because in this approach there emerged, were um, more distant, indirect. So they operate through pathways which influence indirectly uh, HIV, AIDS, morbidity, and mortality, because they must pass through one of the immediate proximate determinants. So we have, this is, this is a model, this isn't reality, it's a modeling of reality, it's a theoretical picture of reality. And it seemed to me that we um, could think of some alternatives, but we should also recognize that um, it has 
quite strong purchase because it it works very much like microeconomics does, and it also is very similar to the demographic models which inform fertility decision making. So it's it's familiar. It can appear to us as common sense, but it's quite important to me that it is actually a theory. I wanted to look at some examples. So, um, and here's where I'll have to come back to the issue of why I delimited Southern Africa. This has to do with my conception of structure, which is slightly different, I think. But um, I will show you the examples that I found. Um, and they're not so different to those, they are those which were also being found by meta surveys um, at the time. The question, one of the questions that emerges in this is, how do we know a pathway when we see it? And I have a quote from um, Dean et al. that includes um, the other editor of this special issue and also Justin Parkhurst. Finally and critically to influence HIV risk, any distal factor must do so by changing one or more direct proximal factors. Migration must affect a factor that is related to the number of potential exposures or affect factors that mediate risk for any given sex act, all of which may change over the course of an HIV epidemic. And these connections are known statistically. Where do you get the ideas about what things you'll look at? Well, there it seemed to me that actually you know those things by um, common sense, by reading of the literature, by sometimes just thinking through, you know, in your own mind what might work and what might not work. That is, I found uh, the approach to be quite a theoretical in the identification of pathways. And that's, I want to come back to that issue um, later on. So this is then where I looked at these um, prevention interventions in Southern Africa. And I've divided them up here uh, just by the kind of intervention. I'm not going to go through in detail each one. The structural pathway that it targeted, the target population, and what it thought it would look at, verify statistically. So the first one was a microfinance uh, with gender training program in which the London School of, of Medicine and Tropical Hygiene, <laughs> sorry, um, got it backwards, but was a participant. So this one was aimed at as a structural pathway, it was looking at gender-based violence. The argument being that if women are actually accepting sexual relations which are risky for them, there is some kind of extra force involved and it focused on rural women in Limpopo in South Africa. And it was a random controlled trial. The second one, the conditional cash transfers, was done in Malawi. And it was girls' school attendance, so it focused on girls of school age, enrolled or not enrolled. And they were rural, urban, and peri-urban, but did not include the affluent people, so rich, the rich were excluded. And they also had a random uh, controlled trial. But actually, HIV was added on later. The original purpose of this was uh, simply to find out whether you could use cash transfers to keep girls in school longer. Um, the third uh, one is one which is, I think, the weakest of the three is gender consciousness training for sex workers. It also was based on looking for gender-based violence, and it focused originally on women urban sex workers, um, and it also used a random control trial. It was adopted from a U.S. project which was focused on women who were drug users. It seemed to me that all of these projects with their limitations are actually examples of what I want to get at in the title. We have thus evolved a modern epidemiology that is adept at under determining which individuals are at increased risk, but not 
at understanding disease distribution within and between populations. So it seemed to me that all of these three were examples of being atheoretical in their questions about social processes, in their identification of pathways, in their choice of subjects of interventions, and in the interventions themselves. They all focused on gender inequality. Um, they assumed that sexual violence was the reason for the differences in outcomes in um, HIV um, incidents between men and women. They focused on women because there are more women who are HIV positive in Africa than men. And they, um, so they, this is common sense, but statistically derived idea. And they chose interventions which oddly mirror, or I think probably not oddly mirror, the standard World Bank current package for what works in poverty alleviation. These are all micro-level interventions. So they ignore the theoretical literature which suggests that around, for example, microcredit, that microcredit is specifically, does not address structural poverty. Um, it works actually for consumption smoothing. It may make things better for people, but it's, it's not a long-term structural intervention. They ignore the gender literature, which emphasizes the importance of not looking just at women, but of understanding relations of power between men and women. No particular reason why men should not be subjects of intervention. Secondly, I think they express the problems of a fallacy of composition, which is that if you reduce the whole to the sum of its individual parts, you miss a lot that's going on. So, for example, you want girls to stay in school longer, and that will lead to their initiating sexual intercourse later, and therefore you might reduce HIV AIDS, or you make them smarter, and that strengthens their bargaining position, and they therefore refuse to have risky sex. There can be many ideas behind this. But if you are using a conditional cash transfer to reach a group of girls, eventually you are going to have to do something about the availability of education for both girls and boys on an expanded scale because you've got a whole to deal with, not just the individual um, people deciding to let their girls go to school or girls, in fact, pressuring their parents to allow them to stay in school. And finally, it subordinates uh, and I think this is a recurrent problem in these, I can't go through them all, of course, subordinates external contextual validity to internal universal validity. What counts is finding statistical relations that indicate with a certain robustness that we can apply these same solutions elsewhere. This seems to me to sacrifice what often came out in these studies about why things didn't fit properly. For example, if we um, take the, the education one, actually um, the rate of school attendance at a primary school level for girls was already better than for boys, which was not dealt with in the research really. Secondly, if you look at the um, uh, problem of the first, the first thing, which was in the Limpopo, which was uh, probably the best of these three, huh? But in fact, what happened was that the group of people that they came up with, the women that they got, tended to be the women who were living there, older women, because in a migrant labor system, that's what often happens. And that was not initially the idea. There was hoped that there would be much better age distribution, which corresponded to the ways in which risk was being thought about at that time. But you had to you have to forget about these complications in order to have a kind of methodology which will fit. And I think that there can be alternative ways to do this. Uh, so first I wanted to ask you, um, I don't think I'm going to give you the time to really think, 
how would you break down the walls of this prison if it is a prison? Certainly it puts things in order. Is there another way to model this that will avoid this problem of the focus at the individual level? I think I'm going to leave you with that question because I, I'm going to give you my own answer. And I think yours may not correspond, and I don't think that, that's, that there's anything wrong with that. One way is just to say, well, we've got to find another theoretical way to break these walls down. This is what Kipax and Stevenson said, and I've quoted them here. Although analytically distinct, effective prevention requires that biomedical technologies, behavioral strategies, and social structures are not treated as separate entities, or in my terms in this paper, the best way to escape from the prison of the proximate is to break down the walls of the prison. So that basically means changing, altering the theoretical space, effacing the distinction between proximate and distal, explicitly theorizing questions to determine the relevance of evidence, and thus navigating our way through a broad space that is both biological and social from the outset. Of course, this alternative then implies something about different ways of working. Uh, first off, that you drive your way through that space on the basis of questions which are framed theoretically within this unified field. The structure that you're looking at is holistic and relational. So you begin with that whole and move back to looking at the dynamics of that whole, understanding that that whole is made by individuals and lived by individuals, but is, its dynamics are not the same as the dynamics of individual decision. And finally, structure is a historically specific notion. Structures change, they're dynamic, and they're defined by particular histories. So we're not looking for universal solutions. And what may appear to be the same in one context may actually be quite different in another. Now, this can be very disturbing to say you're going to break down all of this analytical space. Well, then what are you left with? Uh, where does that leave you? And I think that in order to get an alternative, I found methodologically uh, the work of an epidemiologist, Jeffrey Rose, to be particularly useful. And that's his distinction between what makes individuals sick and what makes population sick. sick. So that's the distinction here. And these imply different things for strategies of prevention. So these are two then different approaches to prevention, I think. A social driver's approach, which tries to find a set of globally applicable discrete set of social interventions that can be tailored in particular contexts. So it definitely recognizes the importance of context, but it tailors them. And that allows them to be plugged in to intervention packages, which continue to be designed by epidemiological experts. And the ones I looked at, they're actually very similar to the older approaches on behavioral change. And a political economy approach which strives to identify the structural relations that affect the incidence of the disease, to look for possible points of intervention, and to ally with those who learn and learn from those who can be involved in long-term struggles to challenge the structural causes of the disease. Because being historical, being long embedded, structural causes are not easily handled with a single intervention. And because they involve looking at contradictory interests, contradictory global interests, they're very unlikely to be funded by, you know, big foundations like the Gates Foundation. Uh, USAID may find them incompatible. Pepstar may not like them. These are different worlds we're talking about. What could you do? Well, again, really, I see a time. So I'm not going to try to go through them, but the main point is that everything is embedded in structure. So for people concerned with HIV AIDS prevention, 
no matter what perspective you work from, you have, uh, you're working within a structure and potentially you have structural impact. So what we're talking about really is what could be counterstructural interventions. And I chose Southern Africa because I think it has a distinctive structure, but I'm not actually going to be able to go through this part of the paper. My main points here were that when I took, for example, the case of a plantation in Mozambique, that the company chose to continue hiring workers, the cane cutters, from distant, distant provinces and housing them in barracks, single-sex barracks, and a kind of work that was extremely intensive and exhausting and which at the end of the month allowed you to have money to leave these walled areas. Um, in this kind of context, yes, you can have AIDS awareness projects, but the workers actually did know about condoms and about HIV AIDS. The problem was the organization of that life, and in their case, actually, as it turned out, access um, to condoms. So what is this, you know, how, what would I conclude out of all of this? I would want to conclude that, yes, I do think, as you could tell from the title in the beginning, that current strategies are caught in the prison of the proximate, that that distinction, which can be so helpful, so orderly analytically, can also be a break to a more solid understanding of how we look at prevention from the point of view of the macro, from the point of view of population, and do not treat it as the summation of individual decisions. Structure is made and lived by individuals, but it is relational and it is historically structured. Counterstructural interventions are thus necessarily based on collective political action. They should be well grounded in research, but they will nonetheless be scientifically uncertain in their outcomes. And I think that most of them will not be fundable by the major actors in HIV AIDS prevention today. I think what's a re was a really interesting, insightful, and also challenging presentation for us all. And I think certainly reading drafts of your work and the, the, the final version, it's helping me think through more clearly my own conception of, of the notion of uh, the structural. Uh, so I, I'd like to open this up now to, to anybody who wants to ask Bridget a question or wants to make a, a contribution. Hi, this is Annie Holmes here. So, Bridget, that was extremely fascinating and a great challenge to all of us. I know that you felt constrained by time towards the end, but as we're not having a rush to questions yet, I think it would be really interesting if you could expand a bit more on this last point. I think the Treatment Action Campaign is an, a very powerful example and one that we've all used many times, and, but other people might not know about it, and that might be nice to expand on a bit but also any other examples or any other thinking forward to give us a sense of how we might break out of this prison, how we might be able to um, combine the insights of epidemiology with a broader, more political understanding. So the first one um, is, in fact, the one that is, inspires everyone, including me, which was um, the Treatment Action Campaign, which, of course, wasn't in on the face of it, about prevention at all. It was about the right to treatment. And it built on alliances um, in South Africa, which some of which were historically unusual. So a very active HIV AIDS lobby based in a pretty well-organized 
gay and lesbian movement in South Africa, but which was also based in the long-term involvement of progressive health forces in South Africa in the long term, even before the end of apartheid. And the campaign drew all of these together and um, made a specific demand, uh, which ended, in fact, the <laughs> quite uh, lingering um, acceptance of dissenters' positions in South Africa. So it led to the recognition of the disease as a disease. And it also then linked this to the demand for treatment, which involved changes in the drug and the availability of drugs and challenges to the international pharmaceutical industry, which um, actually handled this not by making a structural change in its relation to the pricing of all drugs for um, those who could not have them, but to exceptions for the drugs that go into ART with special pricing available, but, but this has really mattered, and it matters now throughout Southern Africa. So it made ART available. That had, at a clinical level, an indirect effect. It affects the relationship between morbidity and mortality. Um, so it does come down to uh, the biological level as well. And secondly, it opened up um, areas of uh, prevention by its recognition of the disease. Um, that is, it termed, a, a, there was a lot of stuff about, still is, about stigma, which failed to differentiate between stigma that was based on real fears, which were not unrealistic, and that which was, in fact, prejudice of one kind or another. Please. So that was also changed. That's enough, yeah. Right? Okay, well, we have a couple of um, questions, Bridget, for you. We have a question from Malcolm McNeil who asks, uh, what should funding agencies be doing differently as a re result of these findings? What would the uh, funding agencies do differently? I'll be straightforward. I think that funding agencies don't make decisions on their own. They have to be pressured politically to do so. So the first thing, I think, is to operate at a national level and develop domestic uh, groups that feel strongly on these issues. So first off, I mean, I didn't get to the Mozambique one, but the funding agencies in Southern Africa have in the long term been strongly committed to the privatization of all health provisioning. And this has meant that in the first wave of behavioral um, interventions, but it could have been anything as a matter of fact, that um, USAID, even before PEPFAR, um, insisted on rooting through things through NGOs. Um, you were not supposed to fund the state. And some of these things led to, for example, in, uh, I can only really talk in detail about Mozambique that I know well, but the ministry's public health information programs faltered. There was very little done. You would go into health posts in the countryside and having ratty-tatty posters. It was um, a, a parallel system. HIV was structured. All of this is very well described by James Pfeiffer. Um, that sort of position will not be changed um, without having pressure from national coalitions and also, I think, from regional coalitions on these issues. It happens that in places where there is a strong argument to be said for involvement in healthcare and long-term struggles, then indeed you will have coalitions forming that push such demands. But I don't presume to give advice to the funding agencies. I don't expect them to take it from my mouth. They will take it from the mouths of those who politically have the purchase to change what their basic assumptions are about what can be done. And I would say, you know, that uh, USAID has softened, and in part this is only a response to the fact that it's very difficult to carry out ART therapy 
in areas where people have absolutely no resources to pay without rooting it through the public health system. But this has not been an easy struggle. Okay, thanks, Bridget. I think that, uh, this is a really interesting issue, and this, this is something uh, kind of what do we do about this that, that um, Andy Gibbs is also picking up with, uh, I think, a really nice question, which I'm going to read in its entirety. It's quite a long question. Okay. Um, so Andy says, uh, I was thinking through this idea of counter-structural interventions. Um, in many ways, the treatment action campaign was an organic response, and I wondered to the extent you thought we could drive such approaches. Or is it not possible, and do we need to support locally emerging responses as they appear rather than seek to generate them? So I guess Andy's asking a question about this sort of political process and the emergence of, uh, you know, politically active groups. One answer, well, there are several answers, but um, in thinking about how counterstructure works, I think it's important to recognize how important currently, not in all countries, but in many countries, um, international aid is in health. It varies from place to place, but it's a huge proportion of the health budget in many countries in, in, um, in Africa. And since that's true, we all have a structural identity uh, within it. Everybody who's, you know, I may be marginal in terms of HIV AIDS work, but I'm an academic who lives off of my research, well, I, that's, I don't live off of anything currently, but at any rate, um, oh yes, I do, the, the, the public pension system of the Netherlands. But um, I think that we also are involved in that structure and that we have quite a lot of purchase within it. The problem is that you have to think about alliances the same way that you do in any kind of political movement. Um, for example, in relation to the particular one that I talked about, which was the workers in the um, agricultural workers in big commercial enterprises, the unions pay very little attention to health issues. They pay a lot of attention to wage issues, but very little to working conditions, um, to health issues. There's, I think, a lot of work for organizations to do with actors that have political purchase within these countries in terms of building coalitions that matter. Now, will you get funding to do this? That's a question. But the second thing is that people who are actually involved, particularly the NGOs that are involved, um, doing have been long-term histories in doing health assistance, uh, like the, I, the small one that works in Mozambique is Health Alliance International, but there are many, that have to take structural decisions about what they're going to do and where, and have had, at least in Mozambique, um, they have had an important role in blowing the whistle on the problems with uh, parallel structures working through NGOs on an impermanent basis. They took positions. It mattered, and it has really mattered for the ways in which now the rural public health system works. Okay, we, we have another question, Bridget, from uh, Matthew Greenall. And again, I think this is picking up on this, this kind of issue of uh, <clears throat> donors, agencies, and funding. So, so Matthew asks, um, a lot of external funding for health focuses on disease-specific results. How does this impact on enable or not enable local and domestic political mobilization? I think I could ask you the question back. The question shows that you're concerned about the issue um, and this um, whole question of the vertical funding is something that people who do work in health economics, in epidemiology, in southern Africa know a lot about. The um, problem particularly now is that with donors cutting back on their budgets, and with so much of the health budget being, uh, particularly for HIV AIDS, and with so much of the health budget being defined by that work, which cannot just be dropped, um, you have a crisis for health funding, for public health funding across the board in these countries. So, but I, I think that there are many people who can talk to the problems with this issue better than I do. They, he, he should probably intervene himself. 
Oh, well, Matthew, if you're if you're there, would you like to, would you like to uh, contribute or or uh, kind of discuss this issue a bit further? Okay, no problem. So, so Matthew is uh, in a background noisy uh, area at the moment. I certainly would like to uh, to thank Bridget uh, again. A, a really interesting talk. I think this is a, a really important conceptual issue. It, it might be it might sit uneasily with us. It might be something that that we we find difficult to to uh, fit with. Certainly, you know, global funding priorities and also, you know, our own approaches to, to interventions. But nonetheless, I think a really, really important contribution. Um, just before I go, again, I would encourage you, um, you know, please do have a look at the special issue. We, you know, we have a, a really wide range of different articles. And, and again, please disseminate with colleagues, especially in this window of opportunity when, when access is, is free to all. Um, so, yeah, and, and thanks very much for joining us. And, and thanks certainly to those that have asked some really interesting and uh, important uh, questions.